Well, 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 I have got a philosophical problem for you to chew on this week. I'm so excited that you're here because I have decided to take Yale's philosophy course. It's an open course. Anybody can take it online. And the past week, I have completed the introductory lecture along with all of the reading materials. And I want to just expose you to one of the critical ideas that this course is going to be covering. And I just found this so fascinating and so exciting. It's called the runaway trolley problem. Now, if you're a student of philosophy, you've probably heard of this before. It's related to moral decision making. What are morals? What is good? What is bad? What is just? What is unjust? And so on. Uh, stick around and listen to this full episode because this one is going to melt your mind. All right, let's jump into it. Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm your host, where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well-read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. Before we get into the runaway or the runaway trolley problem, I want to take a minute and just explain some of the reading I've been doing this week. Uh, as you know, if you listened to last week's episode, I finished up a book called Essentialism by Greg McEwen. It is a book I do recommend. It's short. It reads pretty quickly. That's not the point, though. Take your time with it and really take some notes and try to apply some of the ideas from that book in your personal life. It really is a game changer if you're willing to cut out the unnecessary so that you can focus on what's essential, but it does require that you do your homework. So again, I do recommend that book. I think it is worth your time to read. If you're someone who is uh, feeling a little frazzled, which is probably all of us, <laughs> and you want to narrow down the stuff in your life that really matters. So I finished that book and I also did all of the reading this week for the introductory lecture of the Yale's philosophy course. And it was some fantastic reading to let you in on what happened. Now I cover this in detail on my YouTube channel. So if you wanna watch the entire experience of the course, I'll be releasing one video a week there. Just go to YouTube and you can search for the Read Well podcast. You should find me there. And you can go ahead and subscribe and follow along with all of that madness. Anyway, there were two primary texts this, uh, this week that I had to read or that I got to read. The first was a, it was only five pages long, but it was a, a, essentially the introduction to one of the textbooks. And the chapter was titled, What is Philosophy? Written by Simon Blackburn. And he covers several ideas about the enormity of philosophy and what it's trying to accomplish from answering the unanswerable ideas about faith and morality and justice. And those, those very concepts are what make philosophy worth uh, the fight, right? Because you're trying to have conversations about things that truly matter. You know, most of the time, the conversations I have on a daily basis are kind of unnecessary. I mean, I'm talking about where to fill up for gas in my car, and I'm talking about what we're going to eat for lunch, and what show we're going to watch tonight. All those conversations are really surface level and just day-to-day -day boring. So philosophy allows you to get into the meat of life. That is really what this, this first reading was about. But the thing I wanted to share with you that I found most fascinating was he gave an example of a person who goes out into the world and sees the world a particular way. Now, how does he or she view that world? Well, he or she views that world through a lens. We all have a lens that we're looking through in order to make distinctions, make clarifications, and more importantly, to rationalize about what's happening to us. And that lens comes from the way we were brought up, it comes from genetics, it comes from our current belief systems, it comes from all sorts of different things. Now here's the trick, the part that will really mess you up, is you don't realize that you're looking through a lens, you're just living your life. And philosophy's job is to look at the lens. A lot of people think philosophy's job is to look at the worldview, you know, what do things mean. Really what philosophy is doing is saying, hey, are you aware you're looking through a lens? And are you also aware that there are different kinds of lenses out there that allow you to see things in a more unique, potentially a more fascinating, potentially a more intriguing way? Let's really question the lens. So that was the main idea from the first text that I wanted to share with you. And I, I just, I loved that idea. Now, I also got to read a book called Predictably Irrational. We didn't 
cover the entire book, just a specific chapter from it. Uh, this is a book written by Dan Ariely, a phenomenal contemporary thinker. And the chapter we were tasked to read with in the course was on procrastination. Why do we procrastinate as human beings? Now, stick around. I haven't gotten to the runaway trolley problem yet. That's coming, and that's going to be the best part of this episode. But I want you to hear this part from the reading because I think you'll walk away with something useful here as well. So, Mr. Ariely points out the idea that in philosophy, there is a clear understanding that one of the things that makes humans unique in this world is the ability for humans to rationalize and to think about thoughts. So, it's interesting because you can feel sad as a human and you can think about feeling sad. You can you can process it, you can talk about it, you can act it out, you can whatever. Whereas most other animals are really in the survival mode. They're looking for food, they're looking for shelter, and then they're sort of happy and content. We can get food and shelter and we can still be very uncontent because of how we are processing things mentally, emotionally, and so on. We're in a constant state of uh, self-analysis, self-doubt, and everything else. Well, he points out that as human beings, we have that ability to rationalize, which means that we can create plans. And this is one of the fun parts about being a human. You get to create a plan for your future, for your business, for your family, for your weight loss system you want to incorporate, for the books you want to read, for the education you want to have, and so on. You get to create plans. That's the first part, but the more interesting question is, why in the hell do we not follow our own plans? <laughs> he points this out in a very succinct way that we don't do what we say we're going to do. So why is that? And this is what we call procrastination. Why do we put off things that we know are good for us, things that we're excited about? Why do we put off the work? He gives several examples why, and I, I would encourage you to go out and buy this book, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, and check it out. But I will give you a few ideas uh, here as to how you can approach your own procrastination. The first idea he gives us is to accept that we are procrastinators. A lot of us feel like we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Or we have to just, you know, ignore, pretend like we're not procrastinators and just go out and bust our butts. He says that the sooner you sort of accept your procrastination and you learn to work with it, the happier you're going to be and the better your work is going to be, which is somewhat relieving. He also points out that if you really are serious about something, you need to make what he calls a pre-commitment. So it's not enough to decide to lose weight or to read Martin Heidegger's Being in Time or whatever big challenge you want to tackle this year. You need instead to make a pre-commitment and to do that socially. We don't like to let our social circles in on the fact that we're insignificant. We don't want people to know that we're slow or that we fail or whatever. So the moment you tell your friends and family, here's what I'm doing, here's why it's important, and this is what I'm going to do it by, you create that pre-commitment. And now, not only are you obligated to do it, but you're sort of wired um, since the caveman, cavewoman days of life, mental way of thinking kicks in and you have to be competitive, you have to keep up, you have to really make it happen. And uh, it's just a really powerful way to get yourself to do the thing you don't always want to do. So this, this was the second form of reading that uh, we had to do for the week. And these were just, um, they were light readings because it was the introductory lesson. And it was fascinating, super fun to read. It took maybe two hours to get through all of the reading. And then I watched the lecture. Now here is where we're gonna to get to the runaway trolley problem. Hey everyone, I wanna take just a quick second in the middle of this podcast to tell you about Highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add I-S-H at the end. Highlightish.com is the tool that I use to make better book notes and to organize my writing. It's where I go to capture my favorite passages, annotate them, and then to turn that research into essays, blog posts, or research papers. If you're someone that wants to get more out of the books that you love and you wanna turn that into great output, go to Highlightish.com today. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. Okay, prepare to have your mind really messed with. The runaway trolley problem, it's a philosophical problem posed by a contemporary 
philosopher named Philip of Foot. Uh, it's a British philosopher, and it really is sort of digging into the idea of moral decision making. What is right versus what is wrong? And the concept we're playing with here is that negative actions carry a different weight than positive actions, even though the outcome might be similar. So let's get started. Okay, I want you to imagine with me, if you can, you're at a train station and there it's, you know, trolleys are coming back and forth on the tracks. Well, at the train station, there is a group of five people waiting at the platform. And down the line is a trolley coming and it is unable to stop. It is, you know, the brakes aren't working or whatever and it is just coming full speed. Well, on its current course, it is going to slam into these five passengers and kill them all. And that is of course a, a terrible thing. However, there is a switch that can be pulled that will change the track. It will set the trolley on course into a different track. Now, if you pull that, the trolley will indeed change course, but there is one person standing at that second platform and you're gonna smash into this one person and kill him or her. So the first question with the runaway trolley is this, do you feel it's ethical and appropriate to throw that switch so that the five people are not killed and instead the one person is killed? So I'll let you chew on that for a minute. I would love to see who is raising their hands and who is not. Uh, me on a personal level, think it's completely appropriate to pull that switch and to let one person die versus the five, but that's just me. Some people might not agree with that, but uh, in the lecture, she asked for a vote and almost every person voted the same. Now, who, who might not vote that way? Perhaps somebody who is a uh, fatalist. They believe that all actions, I believe that's the uh, definition of a fatalist, I'll have to look that up, but that all actions are predetermined and set and you shouldn't mess with destiny and on. Maybe those people, I don't know, uh, or people that just are hateful. <laughs> I don't know, but we're saving four lives, right? The equivalent of four lives. So why wouldn't you do it? Okay, let's make things a little different now. Let's go to phase two of this philosophical problem. Let's say we're back at the beginning and that trolley is coming full speed towards those five passengers. Well, on that track, there is a bridge that spans this track. Okay, it's, it goes up and over the, the track and the trolley is gonna go under that bridge. And standing atop of that bridge is a very large, massively large portly man. In other words, he's very, very obese. And you can pull a lever now and if you do, it pushes the overly large man off of the bridge so that he lands upon the track and the trolley smashes into him. And he is so big and so heavy that his weight ultimately stops the weight of the trolley and saves the other five lives. So now things are slightly different. Do you feel it's ethically okay and, and morally good to pull that lever such that the man is pushed off the ledge and killed in order to save the other five. So things are starting to get a little different here, right? Notice that we are sacrificing one life to save five, but now it feels a little different, doesn't it? Well, why does it feel a little different? It's because before you were just diverting the train, but now it feels like the act is a little more personal, doesn't it? Because one, we know a little more about the guy that's being murdered. We know that he's big and obese and all that stuff. So it's a little more personal. But two, the action of pulling the lever pushes this guy in front of a trolley. That seems a little negative, a little more negative. Whereas before, it was unfortunate, but there was no real negative action taken. So the weight is a little different. And again, I would ask you to consider, is that morally ethical? Most people in the course still voted, yeah, I mean, that's gruesome, but it's still probably better than letting the five die. Okay, now let's take this to level three. Let's really ramp this up and flex your philosophical muscles if we can. So let's take the five people on the platform and instead of putting them on the trolley platform, let's now pretend that they're in the hospital. These five people are in the hospital because they're about to lose their lives. And the reason for that is that they are all in need of a critical organ to keep their life going. So. For example, one person needs a heart, another person needs a set of lungs, another person needs kidneys, and so on. 
So again, five lives are at stake. And into the hospital walks a perfectly healthy gentleman who has all of these functioning organs. And the moral question is this, is it acceptable to take that person and cut him up so that you can dismantle him and take his organs and then give them to these five people? If you're, if you're looking at this in a mathematical equation, we're still sacrificing one life to save five. So first I should ask you, do you feel like this is morally ethical and something that should be done? Now, when the lecturer asked this, uh, I believe her name's Tamar Gendler. She's a super genius lady, fantastic lecturer. I, I highly suggest you take this course and watch these lectures. They're very in intriguing. But she points out the fact that very few people in the audience are now voting that this should happen. They, for, for whatever reason, they feel that this is no longer morally ethical. We should not just take a guy and chop him up to save five other lives. But looking at it mathematically, we're still benefiting five lives and only losing one. So why is it that in one situation, you felt completely justified in doing it, and in the final situation, you're going, whoa, hold on a minute, this seems wrong. That is philosophy. That is why philosophy is so much fun, because when you think you know something, when you think you have something figured out and you are rock solid on it and you are spitting, foaming at the mouth, ready to fight to defend that idea, you're online yelling at people, telling them they're wrong and they're stupid and that you have all of the research and everything, philosophy helps you realize that maybe you're not right. <laughs> maybe what you held so dear, in fact, actually isn't correct. I have created a little notebook for me to take notes on this course, and I found it very helpful to buy some stickers to put on the outside of this notebook, one to personalize it, but also for it to have more of an emotional connection for me. And I went on to Redbubble. I love getting, there's no, uh, no sponsor at all. I just love Redbubble. But you can pretty much get stickers for anything. So I went there and typed in philosophy stickers and found a whole bunch. And my favorite one says, it's got the word philosophy on it. And then below that, it says, all your questions answered, right? Uh, and that's crossed out. So all your questions answered, that statement is crossed out. And below that in red pen, it says, all your answers questioned. And that is in fact what philosophy does. It takes a person who thinks they know everything and then makes them begin to question everything they think they know and go, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> and you become a more grounded, a more civil, a more open-minded person because you're not so strung up on thinking you have everything figured out because there are a lot of ideas out there and some of them are quite fascinating. Hey, if you found this episode helpful, I would love for you to do me just a quick favor. I know it's a lot and you're super busy, but um, it, it would really mean a lot if you could go to Apple Podcasts and leave me a, a rating. Uh, that's one of the ways that a podcast can really get um, some traction under it. It, it. The more ratings we get, the more Apple Podcasts will promote that podcast and the more people will see it. It's really kind of a, a challenging thing to get an audience built up for a podcast. So I'm going to be here every every week doing these episodes. I hope you're finding them helpful. Uh, I really do love you guys. It means a lot to me to have a reading community who cares about books and thinking and armchair philosophy and just having a good time uh, becoming a lifelong learner. But again, if the content is helping you, just head on over to Apple Podcasts, search for the Read Well Podcast, or you can do this on your phone if you're listening to me on the phone right now. And just go to the shows page itself, and then there's a little place where you can click on the stars, one, two, three, four, or yay, five stars, and then just write a little thing about how the show is affecting your life. Hey, thanks for listening, and until next week, happy learning and keep on reading. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to our website at thereadwellpodcast.com. There you can get access to my weekly newsletter as well as up-to-date show information. Also, don't forget that I learned software development on the side just so that I could build a program to help us make better book notes as we read. If you're interested, go to highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add ish, I-S-H, at the end. Highlightish.com. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next show.